Hey guys, welcome to Motivational Monday. Today I have Miss Reed with me from Damn Daddy. <laughs> I just really wanted to say that out loud. I'm sorry. Um, but we're going to be talking about dealing with some daddy issues and um, how to overcome them overall. Um, so you want to say hello and introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. As she said, I'm Miss Reed, the founder of ZamDaddy.com, where daddy issues drive discussion. Uh, I started my blog about three years ago because I was challenged with some own, of my own personal daddy issues, and I was ready to tackle them and take them down. So it's funny that you said we're dealing with daddy issues because that's the original name that my blog held before it became Awesome. Awesome. I'm excited to be on Motivational Monday today. Yay. So first of all, tell us your story. Let's start there. Well, um, long version. I'll try to be brief. Um, I am the child of teen parents and for most of my life my biological father has been in and out of prison. So he was not my primary caregiver at all. When I was about two years old, my mom started a seven year relationship with who I call stepdad number one. So from age two to nine, I had this wonderful person in my life and he had children for my siblings. And um, when that relationship ended, it was hard for me as a kid because I didn't understand grown up issues. Right. So, um, and it felt yeah. like that person you had become used to yeah. was walking away. Yeah, they didn't just leave that relationship, they left me too. And, and I'll say it only felt that way partially because they never really left my life. But, uh, after but to that, a, well, you it's know, a what, I'll, I'll just be candid because it's on my Please, mom. please. Um, he wound up having a baby with someone else. Mm. So for a nine year old, and for knowing that he already had children, I'm like, oh, this baby comes to live with us? Right. So I didn't understand, like, like no, 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 this, this baby, baby is not this coming. Be here. Um, right, because right. yeah. to you it just seemed like an additional sibling. Right. To your mom, it was a problem. Exactly. Right. Understand. So, um, you know, that was hard. And then my mom met someone new, and they had a child together. So I did not adjust to that person as easily because I'm older now. Mm -hmm. I already like that person. I still don't understand why that person is growing. Here's this new person. So, right. That was difficult, um, but we've since grown and built our own relationship, and I'm, I'm thankful for a lot of the moments that, that person has been there for me in my life. So uh, it's damn daddy. The three A's represent my three primary father figures. That's actually really cute. I love understanding, you know, when people come up with brand names, there's always that underlining meaning, and I love getting to know, like, what that is. So thank you for sharing that so much. Um, what do you think is the best way to deal with daddy issues? I think the best way to deal with any kind of issues yeah. is to really understand how they trigger you. Mm. So for me, when I decided to write this blog and start doing these interviews, <laughs> it, it more so stemmed from a, a low point in life. I had um, stopped teaching. I was a teacher, and I had a car accident. I didn't get to graduate from grad school on time with my friends. So it was all these things happening to me. Um, um, at the time, I started the blog. I was receiving unemployment and like my unemployment ended and it's just like okay girl, like you need to get you gotta it together. get this together um, like quickly but I realized that I had all these walls up not necessarily just in romantic relationships but just with people in general mm -hmm. um, I, I say to people all the time and I think I wrote a blog post called uh, I'm good at making friends but not building friendships so and that's funny because a lot of people are my friends don't agree with me but for me I feel like you know there's so many people who I wish I had invested more time with building and nurturing our friendship but I realized that part of that came from me not really understanding how to do that and me not wanting to get too close to people because they could walk away at any point yeah and realizing more so that it's not always that feeling of abandonment but a lot of times rejection so even like now the friends that I do have if they hang out without me and it might be because they know I'm doing something else that day. And I don't tell them that my other, my something else got me. And I see them hanging out, I'm like, why are you invite me? But she didn't ask me. Right. So, <laughs> you, you know, I deal with that from time to time. So I just think the best way to deal with daddy issues or any kind of issues is to, to find out what your triggers are and then to monitor that. I, I know that I don't like to be yelled at. I did not.
I interacted with my mom, but like he was always on ten. He was not ever, you know, communicating in a way that I was used to her communicating. So I don't let people yell at me. I don't care who it is in the workplace, right. children, you know, right. you're too loud. I can't hear you, you're too loud. Yeah. So you know, understand and just being aware of it is that it's triggering you. Mm-hmm. And it's funny you mentioned about how your blog got started. Um, are you, you familiar with Sarah Jakes, yes. TD Jakes' daughter? Yes. Her blog started at the worst place of her life, and then it transformed into book deals and motivational speaking and all of that. But it really just started as her vent space. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I think it's really cool to take that what may feel like rock bottom and kind of build something beautiful from there. Um, and I really hope yours continues to blossom and grow and all of that um, as well. I, I didn't know that about TD, but mm-hmm. I am familiar with her. Yeah, oh, absolutely. She's like one of my motivators. Like, I go to her for motivation, so okay. I'm like always hearing her sermons and her stories and speaking and stuff like that. I love her. Um, but yeah, she's, that, she mentioned that that's how, that's why she started her blog and, and went from there. Um, so what do you think is the consequence of not dealing with it? I think that not dealing with daddy issues shows up in other places in your life. So like I said, for me, it's been showing up uh, one way that I'm really learning. I wasn't advocating for myself. Mm. I felt like, you know, things happen, you know. You get what you get. You know. That was something that I, I more recently realized, but at the time when I started dealing with daddy issues, I think my first blog post was admitting it's the first step, and then the second one was called trust issues. So I realized that it was showing up in other ways in my life, not and not necessarily romantic ways, but even in my job. Like I was teaching, and I had one person who I trusted. This was my host teacher. I nurtured that relationship. She was like an older sister. But then there were other people in the building who say, don't trust this person. And then that person was telling me, don't trust that person. So I was like, you know, I'm just going to keep everybody I'll at trust bay. <laughs> and, you know, whatever relationship I need to develop with you or you is going to be on my own personal accord. But uh, I realized that I kept everybody at a distance. I wasn't really open to trusting. Especially when you had that kind of energy coming at you and telling you don't trust someone else. But right. that even if they hadn't said that, I've, um, I've been there person. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I think for me, I've what I've learned is the consequence. Because for years, I would feel like as long as you're not adding more pain, I'm good. Like I used, I was, I naively thought that I wasn't upset. I didn't care. It is what it is. And I had kind of taken on that nonchalant persona towards the issues. And I'm like, well, as long as you're not literally hurting me now, it is what it is. Um, but what I have learned is that, for me, it created abandonment issues. And it showed up in two different ways. Either I would cling, or I would push you away. And so the people that I knew would stay, I pushed you. And the people who I knew could leave, I would cling to you. And that was relationships, and that was friendships, and that was family <laughs> dynamics, and it was all of the above. I would either literally push, 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 or cling for your life. And it just wasn't healthy on either side of that coin to say the least. So I definitely think there are consequences whether people um, are aware of it or not. I definitely agree. As far as um, I, I heard so much of myself in that, that whole statement, <laughs> but what stood out more so for me was um, with my biological father, I was probably about 17 when I decided like, you ain't got to talk to me, bro. And we would literally that was be in the for me. same room, just as close as you and I are. And he, didn't and he ain't even there. Yeah. Um, and I and I would have people tell me, even after writing a blog and reading advice, oh, you need to forgive. You, need to forgive. you don't know what my forgiveness looks like. You know, I'm not angry with that person anymore. I just don't have time and space for who they are. Like, that's who you are. Be that person. You just need to be that person in my space. Mm-hmm. And within the past couple of months, I've actually... Um, opened up and started rebuilding that relationship because I, I realized that I was being that person who was either a quick clinger mm-hmm. um, and fortunately he was we were ready at the same time this, this, this go around but so crazy because it's starting to sound like our scenarios are so parallel which is so weird it, I get it but it's weird <laughs> moment where I was like I don't want anything to do with you I was 20 I was like I'm grown what do I need a father for at this point you couldn't get it right at you had two decades to get this right. 
what do I need it now at this point, right? And so, and people would tell me, especially my, my mom was my father's biggest advocate, which mine, was mine so too. crazy to me. <laughs> and you know, my mom used to say to me, she never said anything bad. Right. Um, I had gone to visit him when he was incarcerated several times. I didn't even really understand that, that was a bad thing as a kid. Like, you know, that was just something I would say and when I got older and start noticing people's reactions to it. But I was probably 11 when I asked. And she didn't even tell me. She just showed me newspaper clippings. So she never put her personal thoughts right. on it. Right. And, and more so, she would say, well, you need to talk to him. You need to understand who he is. Or, you know, you know, ask him why he did certain things. It was never, a, oh, he ain't never did nothing for you. Like, I never had that. Even my grandparents were not necessarily fond of him, but they never were venomous when they, they spoke of him, and they never really spoke of him. You know, if it came up, I would say my, my mom's family was, was definitely big advocates of me not of walking away, or mm-hmm. being disrespectful in that aspect. And then I was fortunate enough that my father's siblings really were involved in my life growing up. Oh, perfect, perfect. Um, so what would you tell your younger self? Mm, you know what? I've always prided myself on being a decent judge of character. And my grandfather says that about me still to this day. And, and if are, grandfather said it, it's true. Let's just go ahead and start yeah. there. <laughs> uh, but there are certain uh, friendships and people that I just feel like, that ain't for me no more. And I would say to myself, you know, to, 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 to go with that sooner. Because... Like trust that uh, that judgment? Yes, okay. because there, there have been several situations post-teenage. My teenage years, it just was like, all right, we ain't friends no more, cool. Like, you know, I guess we wasn't meant to be friends. But when I got to be in my, my early 20s and I felt like, I'm not a friend. And, in, and it wasn't necessarily that I didn't have friends because I was a bit, because most of those people still want to be friends with me, but it made me want to give people a chance more. Okay. So more so, you know. A little more forgiving. In my, my mid-20s, I had been more forgiving. It was like, no, that don't work for you because you know, when you trust yourself. When you know that this person is not for you, it's okay to give a person a chance, even if something feels off, or don't let them abuse you. Say that. Because I feel like so many times we don't realize what abuse really is. And I think a lot of times we as a society think that emotional, put your hands on me, we good. No, 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 no. There's financial abuse. There's emotional abuse. There's mental abuse. There's manipulation. There's bullying. There's all different types. Literally. You know, in, in the month of October, I usually focus my, my daddy issues around domestic violence awareness. Mm-hmm. And not just on my own personal story, but the stories of, of friends, relatives, things I see on TV, where it's not just physical abuse, you know. For, for the first time, I really looked at the color purple in a different way, because, you know, one, that was financial abuse for her to be married to Mr. and not have any independence, right. but just that, that emotional trauma of bearing children for who you thought was your father. And he, he wound up not being her father in the end, but just there's so the many levels to abuse that. that people don't acknowledge because if you can't prove someone abused you, you know, people did it really happen? It, yeah. And and just I think about that is even in terms of my first boyfriend when I was in middle school, that was an abusive relationship because he would say all these great things about me and then say all these negative things about me, and played into that because I fed into all the positive things so then now he's saying these negative things like, what, did, what changed? I must be these things because all those other nice things were true so you know Absolutely. and I think one thing to highlight because um, I think domestic domestic violence is a very important issue but it doesn't start with just a slice a person doesn't just walk up to you and slap you they have to play mind games first they have to there's usually financial manipulation involved because you can't go nowhere. I want you to feel like you ain't got no other choice but to tolerate whatever it is that I'm about to do. And then when I do hit you, I'm going to make you feel like it's your fault. And it's, it's all about grooming. Like, I know on Monday's Business Read a while back, I talked about uh, are we conditioned to accept abuse? Mm. And, I, and I think it's important to realize that sometimes the abuser is 
is not the masculine figure in the relationship. Um, but in, back to financial abuse, it doesn't always look like controlling your finances directly. I had a friend who was being abused and having to call out of work. I had a friend who was being abused and that person would break her cell phone. So now you can't call for help and you have to spend your funds on a new phone. So, you know, I'm controlling where you direct your, 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 your money as well. And, you know, that person uh, did such a one time tossed all their groceries out. Like, you know, just ridiculous things. So financial abuse doesn't just look like you can't work or give me the money. It's, it's doing things to... It's, this is how you need to use To control money. what you do with your money. I'm making you spend money that you didn't have to spend. Re, repurchasing things that you already own. Just things of that nature. I remember um, I had an ex, and this was around the time I realized, like, you playing, and I gotta go. Um, but he, we were talking, and his birthday was coming up, and I was like, I was debating, planning a whole trip to Jamaica. And he's like, well, this is what I want for my birthday. And he listed off all these gifts and stuff like that. And I was like, listen. I'm not Santa Claus. A, I'm not Santa Claus. <laughs> B, I can't afford a trip to Jamaica and all these gifts. Well, if you can't do nothing, if you can't do all of it, I don't want nothing. Oh, okay. Then nothing's what you're going to get, dear. <laughs> Toodles. Needless to say, within the week, it was over. But point being, like, that's, if you're not aware of those triggers, it could be easy to say, oh, you're right, it's your birthday, I'm sorry, you know. Mm -hmm. Or you could say, you've absolutely lost your mind, and I'm going to go now, and never talk to you again. It's also be aware of what experiences in your childhood prepare you to accept or reject a certain type of treatment. Absolutely, absolutely. Because when I was talking about are we conditioned to accept abuse, it's interesting because I, I talked about that way before all of these sexual assault allegations came out. But there's so many women, I watched this show called Sister Circle, mm -hmm. and they were talking about that this morning about how their jobs were in jeopardy. Because if you file a complaint, you know, and then if you leave the job, you have to explain to your new employer why you why left you your left. old job, yeah. you file the complaint, now it's a hostile work environment because they know you filed the complaint, and all these different things. So we are kind of conditioned to, to just, just deal, deal with, with it. it. Mm -hmm. um, and, when I, and, and even that still doesn't speak to what I was initially talking about, but just thinking about um, upbringing mm -hmm. and how your parents talk to you and how they talk to your siblings and, you know, those things play a role in how you expect to be treated. Exactly. If you are a child, statistics show that if, if you witness abuse and domestic violence in the home You're as a young man who are 50% to become an abuser than a young man who grows up in a household with, without witnesses of domestic violence. And if you're a young lady, you are twice as likely to so find yourself a, a victim. Um, I had a friend in college. Um, she, I, she literally said out of her mouth that if he's not hitting me, I don't think he loves me. And she literally said, I watched my mother get beat my whole life. That's what love is. And it broke my heart because it really shows that and she believed it. She really felt like if you're not you angry to, to the show point. her that episode of a different world. Yeah. Uh, Freddie saw Gina getting beat down, and Mr. Gaines told her like he loved her to death, and he buried her last year. Because that that's true. So many people believe that. And then I, I think it, it, it goes both ways because the friend of mine who who experienced all that abuse, they had a child together, and then you know kids. When they learn to right. interact, they, they, you know, they hit you. Stop hitting me. It's a baby. You're not feeling abused by a baby, but you have to condition that baby that that's not okay. And then that baby started hitting the mom. And in my mind, I'm like, they this learned that from starts. their dad. Right. You know, they didn't learn that they need to accept abuse. They learned that mommy is supposed to be treated this way because this is how daddy treats mommy. So there's so many different levels to it. And one thing that I would like to share is that just to being conscious of the fact that how you speak to children and how you interact with children becomes their inner voice one day. And this isn't just your children. It's the children you're around. So, like, I coach cheerleading, and I, I'm consciously aware of the fact that I'm contributing to their inner voice one day. And when I'm talking to them, and even when I get upset and things like that, 
I still have to go back and like, there's certain ways you have to communicate to six, seven, eight year old children because at the end of the day, they're, they're not going to say, Coach Tierra said. They they're going to hear, hear it as the themselves. Exactly. You know what? I, I think that's interesting on two levels. One, with my mom, um, my little cousin was living in the house with us. We weren't allowed to say stupid. So I was the oldest. I was about 12. The oldest one of them was six. And the youngest one was two. Mm-hmm. So we weren't allowed to say stupid in the house. You can't call each other stupid. You can't say stuff if you're stupid. The adults in the house, my mom was not having it. You can't say stupid because she did not want us to hear that word and, and associate it with ourselves or anything like that. But I also had a student when I used to teach middle school. Uh, I taught self-contained special education. So some of them had behavioral issues. And, uh, or some of them, their, their emotional or internal issues manifested as behavioral okay. issues. I'll say it that way because I love them like kids. I don't really have behavioral issues. They just acted out whatever was going on inside of them in ways that weren't appropriate for the classroom right. setting. Right. But I had one kid I used to say to him, I love you anyway. Mm-hmm. I love you anyway. And he didn't like that. Um, and I learned that if that child is being abused by someone in the home who's telling them they love him, it makes them uncomfortable. But because now I've associated love with abuse. Right. Or, or even, you know, with that negative feeling, that negative experience that I'm getting from somebody else. And he asked me sometime, one time, why do I keep saying this to him? I said, because I want you to know that even though I don't like what you're doing right now, that doesn't stop me from caring about you and wanting you to be your best self. Mm-hmm. And he said, okay, well, can you not say that anymore? And I said, okay. Once once they say that right. anymore, you know, I just be like, you good? Or find a different way to address that. Mm-hmm. But I had never considered how something that was such a term of endearment, empowerment, enrichment. Viewed as something so right. damaging or for hurtful. Them. For them. Or yeah. a reminder of something traumatic for them. Yeah. So, Absolutely. Yeah. So what do you hope to give back to them? I really like to focus on perspective and being introspective and reflective. That's one of the best things that teaching taught me was to be reflective. Mm-hmm. We often had to, in preparing for the next day with our lesson plans, reflect on what worked well today and how can we do things differently tomorrow. Right. So right now I'm working on a brand as an acronym for discovering, analyzing, and addressing my needs. And I just want to have to be a tool for people to really, you know, sit down and reflect on exactly what you've asked me today. How can I uh, deal with my daddy issues and what consequences are there of me not dealing with them? Because I have so many friends, like you and I, our stories seem to parallel, but there's so many variations of of how daddy issues or just, you know, conflicts arise with different people. And I just want to be able to, to... to be a resource and help people guide themselves through that process. Exactly. And like you said, there's so many different varieties to what daddy issues can look like. Um, I remember a friend in high school, she was saying like, because I was telling her, you know, we were talking about father figures and things like that. And she's like, my father was in the house every night. Her parents are married. She has several siblings. And she still had daddy issues. So it's not yes. always about just not physically being in the home. Her father literally was in the house every day for dinner. I talk about that all the time because you can be physically present and emotionally absent. Absolutely. You can be physically present and physically or verbally emotionally abusive. Exactly. There's not, daddy issues don't just apply to people. They, one, they don't just apply to women. Let's Hello. get that straight. I know a few men with daddy issues. I had a young man who say that, said that to me. And, you know, he and I are friends, so I wasn't offended or felt attacked by it. But I'm like, sir, like, the first thing you share in your story is about how your, your dad has been incarcerated for X, Y, Z amount of years of your life. But that's number one. They don't only apply to women. Correct. They are not explicitly uh, reflective of a woman's sexual choices. Agreed. Because it shows up in so many different And areas. it's not solely about abandonment issues for people who dads weren't there and a lot of people talk about that for men oh I didn't have a dad so I don't know how to be a dad or a sister. like that's not that's not the only way that that, that manifests mm-hmm. so and that's true because a I do know quite a few men that I would consider who have daddy issues mm-hmm. um, but also I know men who did not have a father and are amazing Maybe fathers that. to their Absolutely kids so it's really about a choice because you can choose to say I didn't have a dad so I don't know how to be a dad or you can choose to say, 
I didn't have a dad, but I'd be damned if my kid didn't. You know, but that's one of the things that I've, I've grown to love about blogging about daddy issues and having these conversations is that there are men who are tuned in and who are engaged and who will ask me. I had somebody ask me the other day, how can a man who didn't have their dad in their life be a, a productive dad? Can you just give us a quick little answer to that? Um, I just told them. And because I know this person's backstory, their, their dad died. They didn't just have... It wasn't a, just an absent or... Right. It wasn't a, a choice of, of abandonment. Their dad died. So I said to them, you know, you, you learn from the men in life who, who you admire as that. Absolutely. And then you give to your child what you wish your father was there to give to you. Because there are people who have dads, moms, whoever raised them. And there's things they would change about that. Right. So whether you have a great dad or not, or a great mom or not, there's always going to be something you want to change about your experience. So to not having a person in your life, you do the same thing. You just give to that child what you wish you had. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for being a part of Motivational Monday. I know, I think, I've learned a lot. I think it was a really healthy conversation. Um, so let us know how we can find you. You can follow me on all social media at D triple a m n daddy um and my website is damn daddy.com again that's D-A-A-M-N-Daddy. i love the triple a m n daddy um yeah and look me up on youtube and all that good stuff if you have any direct questions for me i'm more responsive on dms and instagram as opposed to any other social media but you can always send me an email mystery m-s-r-e-i-d at damn daddy.com awesome awesome well thank you so much and i appreciate this opportunity thank you